If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us humbly confess our sins unto Almighty God, devoutly kneeling. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare thou those who confess their faults. Restore thou those who are penitent according to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life for the glory of thy holy name. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant you absolution and remission of all your sins, true repentance, amendment of life, and the grace and consolation of his Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please stand. O Lord, open thou our lips, and our mouths shall show forth thy praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. first reading is from Jeremiah. The days are surely coming, said the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their inequity and remember their sin no more. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm that we will read today is number 119 on the reverse side of the insert sheet. You will read it responsibly. 
How shall a young man cleanse his way? By keeping to your words. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not stray from your commandments. I treasure your promise in my heart. That I may not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Instruct me in your statutes. With my lips I will recite. All the judgments of your mouth. I have taken greater delight in the way of your decrees than in all manner of riches. I will meditate on your commandments. And give attention to your grace. My delight is in your statutes. I will not forget your words. The second reading is from Hebrews. Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and and supplications with loud, loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him, having been designed by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. The word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God.
A reading from St. John. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled. And what should I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. And others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, This voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ.
150 years after the Civil War, academics and amateur Civil War buffs and military strategists still dissect and reenact and argue about its battles and its leaders. And I'm not one of them. But my brother-in-law is. His um, basement has a ping pong table that has become a battlefield. And he has spent much of his adult life collecting Confederate and Union soldiers and setting up and revisioning and strategizing the strategies of the Union and Confederate armies. And all the more for him to exercise his mind in this way and his creativity. And I wonder if it actually has some bearing on how he lives out his Christian life, that he may draw some lessons from the failures and the glory of some of the Civil War's greatest leaders and greatest battles. And in my brother-in-law's circle, there is some discussion about General George McClellan, who was given charge of the Army of the Potomac and considered himself the savior of the Union. As it turned out, or so I understand, he proved to be a great logistical wizard. He organized his armies. He transported them across hundreds and hundreds of miles and keeping them well fed and supplied. They, they really loved him, but he never actually led them into battle. He loved their adoration of him, but he never actually did the things he was commissioned for. So as a result, President Lincoln eventually fired him. And though McClellan still has many defenders today, there are far more who, in evaluating his story, think he shrank away from doing the thing that he was supposed to do. By contrast, Jesus, despite his human fear expressed in the Garden of Gethsemane and here in today's gospel, had no intention of stepping aside from the events that would lead to his death, but also to his father's glory. In all of the gospels, there comes a point where Jesus, knowing the fate that awaits him, nevertheless, sets his face toward Jerusalem and will not be deterred. Here in the Gospel of St. John, Jesus recognizes the arrival of the Greek-speaking converts as the sign that the time for the glorification of God through the cross has come. This is where his mission and his ministry have been heading all along. The die is cast. And Jesus states very clearly that though he has free will and he has freedom of action, he will not step aside from all that awaits him. So let's backtrack a little bit to give this some context. Just preceding this passage in St. John's Gospel, Jesus has demonstrated his power over life and death in the raising of his closest friend, Lazarus. Like his display of anger when he turned over the um, tables in the temple, Jesus shows raw human emotion here, too. He's stung to the heart by his friend's death. And in the company of his circle of friends, he weeps openly. St. John tells us that following Jesus' raising of Lazarus, the religious and political leaders meet to express their determination to kill Jesus because of the great uproar around this Lazarus event. And so this leads to the high priest Caiaphas to insist to the Israelite community, you do not understand that it is better for you to kill one man than for 
the people to have the whole nation destroyed. So we have Jesus in this intimate moment of, of emotion and acting on it with his own power and then the political activity going on around his power. And throughout Jerusalem, there is all this excitement as people speculate and wonder, well, what do you think? Do you think that Jesus will come to the festival with this threat? But following anoint the anointing of his hand by Mary at the house of Lazarus, Jesus enters the city with great acclamation, with palms waving and people throwing their coats on the way to carpet Jesus' way. And we will do the same next Sunday as we celebrate the liturgy of the palms. But back to our passage today. Recall that certain individuals identified as Greeks approached Philip at the beginning of, of the reading, saying, sir, we wish to see Jesus. Some scholars suggest that these are Jewish believers from elsewhere in the Roman Empire where Greek was their first language. But it's really more likely that Greeks is St. John's term for those Gentiles identified elsewhere in the New Testament as God-fearers, those people who are attracted to the belief in one God, but who are not fully included in the Jewish community. They are outsiders who can enter the outer courts of the great temple in Jerusalem, but cannot enter the inner courts where the sacrifices take place. In, in 1871, archaeologists discovered an inscription from the Second Temple that stated that no foreigner was allowed to pass the Temple Plaza, and that whosoever was caught would only have himself to blame for his death, which would come quickly. So Jesus interprets the arrival of these outsiders those beyond the circle of faith who desire to draw nearer as the sign that his death is at hand. He shares a short parable to illustrate this about a single grain dying when it is planted and giving life to many when it bears much fruit. If the seed clings to life instead, its loss is ensured, and on the other hand, those who give their all will receive eternal life. Still, this is not an easy and comfortable course of action for Jesus. Jesus admits this to himself, saying, now my soul is troubled. But this is the very reason he has come into this world. This death, Jesus says, will also glorify God. And if that is not enough for those who have drawn near to him, the sign is confirmed by a voice from heaven that some interpret as an angel's voice and some simply thunder. Earlier, when Nicodemus had visited him in the night, Jesus had pointed to the story from Numbers when as the people died from snake bites, God ordered Moses to fashion an image of a snake and lift it on high. All who saw the image were saved. Jesus, therefore, both early in his ministry and at this late stage, draws upon that story, comparing the healing that comes from a sign lifted on high to the salvation that would come when he himself is lifted on high, on the cross, when he will draw all people to himself. This is also a sign to us. When we are willing to give up our all, stepping out of our comfort zone, welcoming others through our worship and through our work, we welcome those who were once outsiders and now wish to be a part of God's family. The message of Jesus is for everyone, not just a small circle of friends. 
And we know that. But at some point, our own ministries with each other, as important and as fulfilling as they are, must be reexamined so that our ministry to those outside our circle of friends in our community takes precedence. That's part of what it means to say that the hour of glorification has come. That paradox of saving one's life by losing one's life, of losing one's life by trying too hard to save one's life here, is not only about living and dying, but it's about giving way. It's about giving precedence to others. It's about putting the needs of others first. And that's how the seed bears much fruit. We wish to lift up Jesus so that all the world may be drawn to the fellowship of God's people, all the world. But who will speak to us? And how will they speak to us? Which outsiders? One has to wonder if the outsiders in today's gospel came to Philip because he has a Greek name and he was someone who spoke Greek. Are we ready to speak the welcoming language of our community? Or would we rather speak with insider terminology that, that no one else really understands? These Greek-speaking, God-fearing Gentiles were outsiders in the outer courts. And sometimes churches have barriers that prevent the people Jesus has sent to us from really entering into the inner courts. These are not physical barriers, obviously, but when congregations are, even without realizing it, not listening for and not drawing in and not encouraging leadership and ministry with those who may not have a familiar language or last name or address, who are not made to feel truly welcome, then what is at stake? What is at stake? There may not be a sign on our door. Obviously, there isn't, like the one at the temple warning of a swift death to trespassers. It's not that way at all here. But we may have subtle signs that tell people they can only go so far and no farther, and that their shyness or their newness or even their curiosity is not necessarily perceived and embraced as such, and they end up feeling just a little bit outside, very unintentionally unwelcome, very unintentionally. So let us take a look at ourselves and ask ourselves honestly if there are barriers preventing newcomers from participating even more in our beautiful shared ministry to the world. What are they? And how do we break them down? Being welcoming is really important for the hour that has come to us as the church is to be raised up high so that all the world can see and God may be glorified. Jesus was raised high to the view of the whole world on the cross. For us to be raised high as believers, we must be prepared to sacrifice having things familiar, having even if intellectually challenging sermons that don't challenge us beyond our comfort zone, even in the midst of the changes in our parish right now and with our new leadership, not having things familiar, always conducting our lives according to the traditions and the habits that we've had for years. I began by referring to General McClellan, who was pleased with himself and his army, but never actually used the army for what it was intended to do. So are we willing to use St. Peter's and the whole Church of God for what it was intended to do? Are we going to congratulate ourselves for being a friendly church, but not actually having real new friends? 
Jesus said that with his crucifixion, the ruler of this world will be driven out. That's what the arrival of the outsiders meant to him. The ruler of this world that stays in the comfort zone of tradition and habit will be driven out to leave room for the outsiders to come in and feel at home. As he made his way to the cross, Jesus said to all who would hear, the light is with you for a little longer. Walk while you have the light so that the darkness may not overtake you. The light of Jesus is with us now. So let us take hold of the hour that is given to us and lift high the cross that all may be drawn to him and to glory. Amen. Amen. As you are able, let us stand together and say the words of our faith in the Apostles' Creed, page 53, in the prayer book. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, show thy mercy upon us. And do thy ministers with righteousness. And make thy chosen people joyful. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world. For only the kingdom is sacred. Lord, keep this nation under thy care. And rise and justice and truth. Let thy way be known upon earth. Thy saving help among all nations. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten. Create in us clean hearts, O God. O Almighty God, who alone canst order the unruly wills and affections of sinful men, grant unto thy people that they may love the thing which thou commandest and desire that which thou dost promise that 
so among the sundry and manifold changes of the world, our hearts may surely there be fixed where true joys are to be found. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. O God, who art the author of peace and lover of concord and knowledge, of whom standeth our eternal life, whose service is perfect freedom, defend us, thy humble servants, in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in thy defense, may not fear the power of any adversaries, through the might of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our prayers of the people today are on page 392. In peace we pray to you, Lord God. For all people in their daily life and work. For this community, the nation, and the world. For all who work for justice, freedom, and peace. For the just and proper use of your creation. For the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the truth. For Catherine, our presiding bishop, and Andrew and Alan, our bishops, and for all bishops and other ministers. For all who serve God in his church. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation. I ask that you remember in your prayers this week Paula, Melissa, Isabel, Bob, Megan, Julie, Tom, Jack, Betsy, Matthew, Liso, and either silently or aloud, please add your own petitions. Hear us, Lord. For your mercy is great. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. We will exalt you, O God, our King. We pray for all who have died, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. We commend to Almighty God the soul of Joan Bastien, whose earthly span ended this week. And we pray for the glorious completion of her pilgrimage. May she rest in peace and rise in joy. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. O oh Lord our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people in the multitude of your mercies. Look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O oh lover of souls, and to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The general thanksgiving is on page 58. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, thine unworthy servants, do give thee most humble and hearty thanks for all thy goodness and loving kindness to us and to all men. We bless thee for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for thine inestimable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we beseech thee, give us that due sense of all thy mercies, that our hearts may be unfailingly thankful, 
and that we show forth thy praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to thy service, and by walking before thee in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. And a prayer of St. Chrysostom. Almighty God, who has given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication unto thee, and has promised through thy well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, thou wilt be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, the desires and petitions of thy servants, as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of thy truth, and in the world to come, life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. So I welcome you this morning, and I'd like to see if there are any, any newcomers, any guests today. Uh, looks like we'll all be amongst friends at the uh, coffee hour. Um, and I, I think that part of the absence, the, the empty seats, is because it's spring break, so there are a lot of families that are away. And indeed, I just came back from my spring break, which was great, but it's wonderful to be back. And Albert sends his greetings from Miami. He um, is serving at the cathedral <laughs> and um, has done some really wonderful work in his um, St. Paul's commission. And do, do you want to add anything else, Catherine, to what he did the week before? I mean, I'm sorry I missed no, the 15th and Maxentia's visit. And um, I think he might have even brought her to Miami with him. But he is um, preaching at, a, at quite a conservative cathedral in Miami. So it's a, an interesting challenge for him and for the community of God to, to listen to someone who might be um, expressing beliefs that are different from the congregation that he's preaching to. Um, but he'll be back on Tuesday. He and Mile are going to take a day just to sort of catch up on rest in Florida before they come back. Um, but he sends his greetings. Um, and I also want to thank Anne and Anne for the wonderful keynotes. It has lots and lots of really good information in it. And I wanted to especially call your attention to the calendar of events that go into, well into the spring and late, early, early summer, I think. Um, and in it, you'll see the uh, publication of all the Holy Week services, which begin next Sunday, Palm Sunday, where we will have a liturgy of the palms and music and um, a reading of the Passion. Um, so I look forward to seeing you all as you come to these services in this most holy time in our church. Um, are there any other announcements for us? Yes, Catherine. Okay, everybody. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> That's uh, welcome the outsiders. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your ministry of hospitality. Yes, Betsy. Uh, following on my, I've now decided I'll become Catherine Howard's booster. <laughs> 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 Sign up. Sign up. <laughs> Young and old. <laughs> I also want to thank in advance the Altar Guild and the Flower Guild for our upcoming services. Um, we're going to do something new 
next Sunday at Palm Sunday and actually strip the altar so that when we come to Easter services, the place will be ablaze with beautiful flowers. And so I just, again, that's hard work, and I want to thank you in advance for preparing us to celebrate. And yes, Anne? Uh, if you'd like to um, help with the Easter flowers, uh, we've got a notice on the back page of the bulletin today. Please send any memorial names. Uh, we'll be listing the memorial names in Thank the you, Easter uh, bulletins. Send those to the St. Peter's uh, email address or to me or hand them to me or to Pam. Yeah. And um, you can send a check to help out with the flowers uh, at any point. But just make sure please, that you get me the names in the next week. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anne, as always. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God. <coughs> God of peace, who has taught us that in returning in rest we be shall be saved, in quietness and in confidence shall be our strength. By the might of thy spirit lift us, we pray thee to thy presence, where we may be still and know that thou art God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. May the God of hope Fill us with all joy and peace in believing through the power of the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.